So good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm very happy to, to have this opportunity that follows up yesterday's presentation from Ian, trying to discuss at a more regional level, so trying to go more into the details of the different pastoral regions. What are the drivers, the triggers and the drivers of, of uncertainty that, of the uncertainties that pastoralists have to face and to live with through and off. Uh, some key elements about why we are here and what is the process we followed is that we, uh, why, why we are here, well, what did we do was, well, basically we wanted to give a sense to the, to the huge uh, amounts of materials we have stocked in our, in our rooms, in our archives, in our uh, basements. And uh, one good idea of doing that was to try to look what was useful for this project. And uh, so basically what I will tell you about is a literature review that I've been doing in the last months based on the materials that we've been gathering and collecting in the previous decades, me and Ian, and uh, with a specific focus that is uncertainty. So, well, basically what we did is amongst all these materials we had on pastoralism, we selected the documents that had two, two keywords. One was about pastoralism, that could have been pastoralism or shepherding or herding or extensive livestock. And on the other side, some word about uncertainty, that could have been uncertainty itself, but it was it's a kind of recent word, so very many documents in the 70s or the 80s, they don't have this, this uh, fancy word, they just go for instability or uh, um, insecurity, there are different forms of declining, uh, let's say, uncertainty at the field level. So we took these documents that had some keywords from these two, two domains, and then we went into regional analysis. So we, we decided to use 15 documents for each region to go through these documents, to read them through, to select some materials, to understand what were the, the main drivers that were described, which were the, the strategies pastoralists adopted in order to face those uncertainties. So we made kind of analytical review of these documents. So the way we, do, we did it was 15 words for each region. We had, we, we've been reading documents generally about pastoralism and uncertainty in the region, and then we decided to focus on some specific groups in each one, one group for each region, I mean, basically in order to go into more detailed uh, analysis and understanding. In the, i just make one simple example, the case of uh, uh, the Sahel, we focused on the, 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 the Fulani, that is one main pastoral communities. So most of the, of the papers, I would say 10 over 15 have been are somehow related to the, the Fulani experience. So this is about the focus group. All these materials, all the articles we've been going through, you can find them on Zotero, thanks to Linda, we'll be putting them the other day, uh, on the different chapters that goes for the different regions and the different domains. And then we use some kind of analytical tables that I will show you in a while, in order to, um, how do you say, to guide and to structure the, the analysis. And then for this presentation, I decided, because it's a huge amount of information, as you can imagine, I decided just to take one main leading theme for each region, not to go through all the details from the ecology to climate to markets and so on. So one main leading story, let's say, for each one of these regions, in order to tell you a story rather than just give you all the details that might not be very much handy and useful for you. Uh, so, why we did so? Uh, because we wanted to frame uncertainty, as I said, in the different regional settings with uh, the idea to help somehow and guide your work in each one of your regions, but at the same time in order to have a kind of comparative capacity, in order to be able to compare the different, the different trajectories these different regions have gone through and therefore the different degrees and uh, the different quality or nature of uncertainties people have to deal with when they live on, on rangelands. So the table we used, the kind of the format of the table we use in order mm, to simplify, well, to facilitate and to structure our analysis has been this. This is a kind of normal format. There are three main domains. As you know, this is part of the pastures, uh, the pastures rational. We have uncertainties that are related to environment and natural resources, or, or resources in general. There are uncertainties that are associated to the markets and the commodity systems. And there are other sources of uncertainty that are, relation, that are related to the institutional settings and the, the governance systems and structures. So we have three main lines. And then 
for each line we also made some columns in order to understand which was the group, the area, uh, which have been the, the, the challenge or the pressure that has been tackled in that document, because it's still a bibliographic review, not forget that. And uh, so what were the challenges related to uncertainty for pastoralists? in these columns here and on the other columns here uh, we we try to uh, uh, depict and classify the, the ways the strategies pastoralists applied in order to react uh, adapt cope with and uh, play with those uncertainties so we basically have two main columns one about the challenges brought by these new uncertainties well the shifting uncertainties i would say and on the other column the way people pastoralists reacted and uh, adapted to the to these uh, new challenges. Yeah. I'm moving so the, the voice might be in and out because it's a mobile uh, presentation. Uh, as you can imagine, most of these dynamics are related to historical patterns, political decisions, uh, socioeconomic trajectories. So it's just a mix of very many different things, as we will see. And interestingly enough, each region is very, uh, is very unique in the sense that uh, while uh, some of and what is interesting is that while some of the principles inspiring the reacting strategies of pastoralists, they are very similar uh, in very different settings, the different settings are very different. So this somehow gives, gives a good uh, hope for our project that we are looking into things that are pertinent and consistent, meaning that pastoralists, they tend to behave in very similar ways despite the very different settings they're living in. As Ian stated yesterday, we enlisted a number of uh, commonalities that we found amongst these regions. And uh, basically, they, when we talk about environment and resources, they deal with the, the growing demography and the pressure, population pressure, as well as livestock pressure. To give an example, in the Maghreb and Mashrek, North Africa and the Middle East, there are calculations that are just made uh, based on, uh, uh, on, on what was feasible to be done by Alain Bourbouz that say that in the last 100 years the, the animals have quadrupled, so 400% increase in uh, 100 years of animals in very uh, dry settings. So this means that the population, the population and livestock uh, pressure has definitely been growing quite consistently in, in the last decades. Then the problem is associated to, to mobility, the seen like the state uh, paradigm as we've seen, climatic change, that, uh, as we said yesterday, is raising the, um, the, the unpredictability of the climatic patterns on one side. But on the other side, we shall not forget that it's also raising the extremes. So we will have more uh, uh, hot drought spells and uh, uh, more cold frost spells on the other side. So it's, it's also pushing on the extremes. Th these are, I, mean, well, I think this is an element that, that adds up to livelihoods when it comes to pastoral uh, settings because the animals can stand certain temperature but it will be difficult to go further than that then we discussed about the issues of degradation of the rangelands the whole debate of, of desertification that is very often one of the key debates that have interfaced state with pastoralists because the idea has always been who's who's responsible for which kind of degradation and what is degradation? I mean, who's looking at degradation and how to, to define degradation? So this is especially in the MENA region, Maghreb and Mashrek, and in Central Asia is a key element of discussion about is there degradation, who's responsible, which are the patterns and what are the solutions? Encroachment on rangeland, as we said, co the contestation of rangelands for other economic activities, urbanization, farming, e evolutions, and so on. The patterns of sedentarization that we've seen with the growth of uh, rural towns and, and, uh, and urban areas. The shifts as well in the labor force. In all the regions, we found that the, there's a growing uh, degree of hiring herders, I mean, hiring herding labor force. So very often it's not the people with, within the family that uh, provide the labor to the to the flock or the herd this for what comes to the, the resources when it comes to market and commodities the degree of market integration following the livestock revolution as it is called has been quite intense in the last decades as we know there have been forms of specialization and diversification that have changed the, definitely local markets and local and local pastoral livelihoods and there have been degrees of socioeconomic differentiations as we've seen with inequalities growing social stratification 
and even new cleavages. As we say, the role of gender, looking into gender aspects or generational uh, conflicts uh, or class conflicts or class related conflicts as well. So the whole uh, socioeconomic reshuffling of pastoral systems and societies. And then the third one is the one associated to institutions and governance. And we know that in most countries, the relationship with the state has been the key of uh, uh, most of the uncertainties that people, that, that pastoralists had to deal with in the, in the last decades, whatever was the region or, or the, the country. And the fact that very often pastoralists, despite there might be regional uh, majorities in population terms, they often end up being national minorities. So very often the pastoral lands and the pastoral populations have been cut into by the different frontiers and borders and therefore we have the Borana people on one side, the Tibetans on the other one, the, the Fulani, that there would definitely be a regional majority if the region was shaped differently, but they find themselves in a small minority in countries that have very often the capital city in the greener part of the, of the country. And then the idea, yes, of pastoralists as a, tr as a kind of threat, threatening the national uh, stability uh, because of ecological dynamics or because of political dynamics. No, we, we saw yesterday how the, the development paradigm somehow changed from uh, uh, conceiving pastoral areas as underdeveloped and therefore to be assisted and to be helped to the idea that uh, pastoral areas are dangerous, are areas where terrorists, insurgent groups and so on are hiding and therefore they're, they're providing a different threat to the, the national country and the regional uh, stability. And one other interesting element is that very often there is a, a kind of uh, ecological or socio-political uh, dramatic event that enabled, uh, uh, in most of the cases, the national state to, to push for a, a, an agenda that would have reshaped pastoral territories in a way. We are talking about major droughts in the MENA region or, and even in the Sahel. We are talking about uh, earthquake in some other areas, even in Abruzzi, by the way, in Italy. And we are talking about famine and, and uh, other forms of conflict, such as in northern Kenya. The idea that uh, the, um, the shift of war somehow changed the system in which rangeland used to be traditionally managed be beforehand, no? In, in the Borana area, as we, we've seen. So these are somehow the commonalities that uh, we found that could be, that we could say that characterize the relationship with pastoralists and uh, the markets, the environment and the state throughout the different regions. Let us now go to the different regional chapters that present some specific cases. And as I said, for each case, uh, one title, one story to, to tell rather than telling all you all the details because that would be too much of information and not too much of use. So let's start with Central Asia. Central Asia, you know, the, the, well, you know, you might have heard the other day, Friday, when it was presented by Palden, is a very specific setting because is a, is a mountainous, uh, is a plateau, basically, is a very cold plateau, and therefore the, the ecological constrictions of that setting are quite different from those that most of you are associated with. So the, if I think about Maghreb, the Mashrek, or the whole of Africa, the ecological setting here is quite different. And uh, the Central Asian rangelands are quite huge. I think it's about one third of all rangelands in the world are uh, in this uh, part, in this part of the, the globe. And they go from the mountainous areas of uh, southwestern China to northern India up to Siberia and uh, all Central Asia rangelands, Tajikistan, uh, uh, Kazakhstan, and other parts. So. The main groups in the region are the, the Tibetans, for sure, the Mongols, the Kazakhs, the Tajik and the Pashtun, if I remember well. These are the main pastoral or agro-pastoral groups inhabiting this region. And some of the key word here is that there's been this kind of uh, societal and environmental engineering whereby the state definitely pl played a key role in, uh, reman well, in uh, pushing pastoralists to change the, the resource management and creating at the same time some ruptures, as we said, and some opportunities. Because uh, as we've seen yesterday, when you have these big, uh, big programs, there are always uh, uh, smaller ways of uh, playing with the, with the system. So the idea is that uh, 
uh, the, the environmental and social engineering that has been taking place has created an enormous change on uh, Central Asian rangelands. Nevertheless, pastoralists are still finding their space for maneuver and their, uh, their room and opportunities to play with the system in a way that can be consistent with the pastoral uh, principles. Uh, the political agendas that have basically driven these choices have been mixed, well, a mix of different principles, including economic growth, so providing uh, uh, animal proteins for the population on, one, population on one side, poverty alleviation, meaning that, uh, uh, as it was the case elsewhere, poverty rates were higher in some pastoral areas, so the idea was to support them through market integration, ecological concern, as the case of parts of Tibet where people, I mean, well, where pastoralists are moved out of rangelands because, as we said, uh, they are associated to their degradation, and political stability, because in certain areas we've also seen that uh, the, the um, control of pastoral population could be critical, especially close to, to the borders, when it comes to the political stability of the country and of the region. So, incorporation has been the driving force Incorporation in state and market dynamics has been the driving force for shifting uncertainties in Central Asia. Logical features is one of the most arid regions, regions in the world. It's uh, the, the one with the lowest, uh, I think, the lowest water per capita rate. So the, the water scarcity is one, definitely one of the drivers of the local ecology and the local uh, economics and politics. Uh, n not only water is scarce on a, on a normal basis, but there have been drought events in the, 50, in the 50s, the 60s and the 70s that have been, uh, that have been causing important uh, changes in pastoral livelihoods. Uh, the agricultural land, so the greener portions of the, of the region are very few, very limited. I think it's about 5% of the whole MENA region is, uh, uh, of the land of the MENA region is associated to to agricultural production in the sense of crop production. And uh, as I said, population and livestock rates have been growing quite consistently in, in the last decades. It's one of the regions with the highest population growth rate in the, in the world for the last three to four decades. And uh, as well, there are indications that the, exposures of the, the exposure of the region to climate change uh, is higher here than elsewhere. And the degree of um, of uh, heat growth as well as as uh, and associations to drought events is higher here than anywhere else in, in the world. So it's definitely one region that has a specific exposure to climate change dynamics. Uh, once more here, it's not incorporation that I would say as a word, but inverse mobility, and I will come to tell you why. But the idea is that even here, the state the states, the state, I mean, state, policy, state policies have been playing a critical role in, in reshaping pastoral livelihoods and in creating new dimensions of, of uncertainty. In the post-colonial period in the 50s, the 60s and the 70s, initially uh, most of the states went for a self-subsistence uh, political regime in the sense that they wanted everybody to produce whatever was feasible in order to be in order for the country to be self-subsistent. This proved not to be effective when the droughts in the 70s and in the 80s struck the whole political economy of, of the region with uh, huge amounts of people moving out of rural areas because of famine. And therefore, uh, the new political setup has to, to reshuffle and therefore they accepted that food import would have been one of the major driving, driving forces to, to secure food security to the local population. Today, MENA region is the most uh, uh, food import dependent region in the world. And this is, uh, on one side, can be explained by the fact that there is little uh, agricultural land when it comes to producing cereals. And on the other side, that a number of, this count of uh, MENA countries uh, have the opportunity to exploit all oil, uh, oil and mineral uh, uh, resources that give them the, op the capacity and the opportunity to purchase food on the global markets. Uh, so, in the beginning, livestock producers, as much as crop producers, were given incentives to produce as much as they could, and therefore they were 
giving incentives to transport water, to purchase feed, veterinary services, technical assistance, whatever was there in the 60s and in the 70s in order to assist this process of producing whatever was feasible in order to make the country self-subsistent. Uh, so they were somehow driven into market-related dynamics because they had to produce enough to sell to the market and to feed the, the, the demand, to, to serve the demand of a growing uh, consumption population. Then the paradigm shifted, as we said, uh, the, the market, I mean, it was decided that opening up the market to the global uh, dimension was the option to ensure self food uh, sufficiency, and therefore uh, the public money has been used to other purposes, such as stabilizing people that were moving out from the, the rural areas to the urban settings, and uh, the degrees of subsidies and technical assistance in, in, in rural areas decreased consistently. So the, the rural areas, from being the center of the political economy in the, in the 60s and the 70s, became marginalized politically and economically in the 80s and the 90s. But the major step of driving those e economies into market-driven dynamics was already made, so people somehow were squeezed between feeling themselves depending on the market for the inputs as well as for their outputs, but, but receiving much less incentives, subsidies and support from the central state. Uh, what happened at the same time was that there was a huge uh, investment in uh, basic infrastructure and in, in uh, technological developments such as uh, uh, trucks, uh, I mean, I would say in general motorized uh, transportation and eventually in the last decades in uh, mobile phones and uh, systems that could connect the countryside to the, the urban setting. So what we have nowadays is the result of this, uh, this whole process has been that nowadays you mostly have inverse mobility is because very often you find that in very many farms the animals don't move very much despite people they still consider themselves as pastoralists the animals don't move that much but it's the water or the feed or the, or the forage or the animal feed that is brought to them so it's a, in, in the, the inverse mobility because there is still mobility but are the resources going to the animals uh, rather than the animals moving towards the resources and uh, this can also be somehow conceived at a different degree because one of the patterns that have characterized pastoral systems in this area have been the important rate of people moving out of pastoral areas, not, on, not just to go to living in the urban settings or, or to move to farming lands because the limitations were there, but even to uh, migrate out of the, the country and the region and going either to Europe or to the Arab world. So there's been a huge, uh, a, a huge process of out-migration from the countryside and especially from the range areas. And uh, this phenomenon of uh, international immigration is quite visible in uh, parts of the Atlas in Morocco, in southern Tunisia, in parts of Algeria, as well as in, in Syria nowadays for other reasons, but even in Lebanon, mountains and so. So pastoralism, so very often pastoral households in the MENA region are associated with one or more members that have emigrated internationally. And very often, once more the inverse migration, what is interesting is that you have money from remittance sent by the, 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 the household member living abroad that is helping in uh, managing the herd or the flock, especially at times of drought. So it's the money from remittance that is fed back into the local uh, uh, head or flock, and very often the the labor to take care, I mean, the shepherdly labor to take care of the head or flock is uh, hired by somebody else. So the, the relationship between the head or the flock, the household and the rangeland has been completely reconstructed in a way that uh, you have uh, the shepherd is not somebody from the family, the livestock is not living of the rangeland products, and the um, and the real family, the real pastoral member of the family is living maybe in Italy or in Spain. So it's a kind of complete deconstructed system that still provides, nevertheless, for uh, I mean, room for opportunities for keeping a system uh, uh, functioning and developing to a good extent. Then moving on to other, uh, well, one of the regions that in these days is quite under the is on the headlines of, of the pastoral uh, newspapers 
is Mediterranean Europe. This picture was taken in our, uh, during our uh, trip to Sardinia. That is, by the way, in this same moment, there are discussions, there are negotiations in Rome between Sardinia and pastoral associations and the government. In Greece and Italy, we've seen a decrease of about 50% of the, the livestock farms in mountainous areas. So we, 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 we are now dealing with a half of what we used to have uh, 20 years ago in terms of farms. Then all these farms, they have to increase, in certain cases, the number of animals the number of animals in order to uh, account for the per capita production costs that are sometimes very high, well, in very many cases quite high, and therefore there's not, not only a squeeze in societal terms for pastoralists, but even when it comes to the market, because your lamb is, is, is worth nothing, your milk is worth very little, as we saw in Sardinia, so when you have to receive money from cap subsidies and go into the market with your products, there's a, well, the opportunity of losing from th those kind of transactions is quite high. And that is the last point on Europe is that there's a problem of generational renewal. There are very few young people that would like to engage into this sector as a result of this dynamic. So this is just to say that even in a system that is uh, supported, assisted, uh, financed through public uh, policies and public money, still there are big trouble and uh, young generations might not see that as a livelihood opportunity for themselves. Then let's move to the sub-Saharan African cases where we have some elements in common and some elements that are divergent. We have the Sahelian case on one side and the Horn of Africa on the other side. When it comes to sub-Saharan Africa, most of the works we've gone through, they definitely mention climate change or climatic related uh, climate related dynamics as a, a major driver of uncertainty in the sense that uh, the, the ecology of rangelands in some areas are uh, changing this is according to what people perceive and what people feel and uh, what scientists tell as well but this is not just for the worst there are areas such as in the sahel where uh, there's been a greening and a, more of a greening is predicted in the decades to come so Climate change is not necessarily for the worse in the sense that there will be winners and losers. There will be areas where there will be less rain, definitely. There will be areas where, where there will be more rain. So basically some areas could be converted to, uh, to some desert area could convert to an extent to kind of rangeland areas. But it's also true that very often when we think about pastoralism, we mention the problem of drought. That is quite uh, often the case in all African contexts. But the reverse is also true, that the problems related to flooding and to the long-standing presence of water in some areas could, bring, could be the driver of uh, animal health problems and diseases such as trypanosomiasis on one side and rinderpest on the, on the horn side. So climate change is one of the major drivers that is uh, shifting uncertainty in the, in, in the environmental setup for pastoral areas in sub-Saharan Africa. And another one I, I would say is that of conflict. Conflict can be conceived and can be uh, analyzed through different perspectives and there are definitely, we, we are using the same word to define and to depict very different phenomena. There are local conflicts associated to temporal use of resources at local level that can be, by the way, manipulated or uh, instrumentalized by, po by local politicians for uh, political purposes and blah, blah, blah. There are international conflicts between Ethiopia and Eritrea, as we've seen for the last 30 years. There can be internal uh, social uh, civil conflicts, such as the case for Somalia. There are uh, conflicts associated to cultural and ecological identities of people using uh, the same land with different purposes for cropping or for herding. There are uh, conflicts associated to the presence of weapons that is quite extended, in, uh, especially in the Horn of Africa, as a result of international and larger conflicts, such as those in uh, southern Sudan, in uh, Ethiopia and, uh, and uh, in Somalia. So conflict is definitely one of the key words. Conflict can be military conflict, can be a civil conflict, can be a technical conflict, can be a land use conflict, but definitely conflict is one of the key words I would use in general for sub-Saharan Africa. And, and conflict per se, it's also a way of uh, playing with power. So in certain areas, we've seen through the articles, through the, the literature, that, that conflict, that as an example, belonging to a militia or playing with violence could be one way of enforcing use of land, of, 
or of reclaiming a political identity within the national or regional setup. Going into the specific details of the Sahelian region, one more mention is that, trans, I mean, as I said, transhuman is, transhumans is driving animals one way and another, and together with animals, it's also, it's, so, it's also very, it's quite the case also for many commodities to move through the same, uh, the same corridors. So while uh, uh, drier areas provide animals to greener areas, it's also true the other way around that uh, most of the crops and the cereals uh, consumed uh, amongst pastoralists, they are sourced through these uh, greener portions of the, of the southern portions of the, the, the Sahel. But what is interesting as well is that the transhuman corridors that very often link this part to the center of the Sahel and the Sahara, they also move up to the Maghreb, to northern Africa, and they were used as well in historical times to trade uh, salt and other staples and, and uh, commodities from northern Africa to central Africa. So basically the Sahel is an area that is crossed by a number of corridors that link for sure the southern coastal portion to the, the Sahel itself, but they are also coming from the north and bringing commodities and, uh, and, and opportunities and resources isn't from the Maghreb. So the Sahel finds itself at the end in between two territories that are quite different and quite strategic. And I'm saying that because recently these, uh, the, the corridors, the transhuman corridors that eventually had become trade corridors that link uh, uh, Ivory Coast to Algeria, they become as well the corridors to which a number of other uh, less legal, I would say, traffics and trade are taking place. Uh, this is, I want to mention this because that is one of the drivers of the insecurity that is now characterizing the region in one way and the economic booming of some communities living in this part of the, of the region because uh, there have been economic and political agendas that have been reshaping quite consistently the institutional and the socio-political setup of the region. They are associated to a number of dynamics that relate to this kind, to the use of these uh, trade routes in, uh, let's say, postmodern or uh, less legal ways. Let's go through the last region that I want to mention here, that is the one of the Horn of Africa. The Horn of Africa is better known to most of us for uh, our direct experience, and uh, as I said, it's also visible in uh, more uh, national political terms. If in, in the Sahel we have seen that there's been a degree of regional integration that has also been uh, been, been elaborated, been developed through the local ecological systems and, and the way people were using resources. In this case, the situation is much more fragmented even at uh, national policy levels. You have countries such as Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia that have gone through very different political trajectories. And therefore, people living one side and the other of the borders, very often the same population, they, find them, they found themselves with different opportunities on one side or, or the other of the border, depending on which was the government in place. So, just to say that the kind of homogeneity and the kind of uh, ecological diversity and population homogeneity that we found in the Sahel is definitely not the one that is characterizing the whole of Africa. Uh, borders have been contested and uh, postal populations are very often living along borders. The Ogaden War is one of the cases, the Shifta War, the other one, the Karamoja Triangle, South Sudan. This region is interesting in some cases when talking about state building because in the last uh, 20 years, uh, three new states have been, three, three new national states have been given birth. South Sudan, uh, Eritrea and uh, Somaliland, though Somaliland is not recognized. So definitely is a, a, is a political setting that is uh, continuously reshuffling and is continuously changing uh, in uh, political as well as in, in, uh, in political economic terms. Uh, I mentioned the issue of conflict that very often in part of the literature we read through is uh, in, in northern Kenya is associated uh, between is associated to conflicts amongst different pastoral groups 
but it can also be conflict, as I said, among different states, as the case for Ethiopia and Eritrea. And in that case, pastoralists were just living in the border, so they were paying the highest fee to that conflict. It can be a civil conflict or a political conflict, s such as what we saw in Somalia in the last 20 years, and we are seeing with Al-Shabaab nowadays in recent times in uh, southern uh, Somalia and northern Kenya. Uh, Fragmented pastoral constituency, little regional integration, poor presence of the state in pastoral territories, and, uh, and the rates and degrees of pastoral poverty and exclusion. We mentioned some of the key areas, South Sudan, Karamoja, Southern Somalia as the most conflicting areas that uh, on one side, uh, the case of Somalia to me is very clear, and Somalia indeed to me is a laboratory, is a lab where things are happening, uh, because uh, there's the... The political economy of Somalia is critical to the whole region. It, it is through the Somali coastlines that most of the livestock are exported to the Arab world. But at the same time, what is happening internal to Somalia, the kind of hybrid uh, institutional settings that have been created in Somaliland, Puntland, and in the different regions of Somalia, are quite uh, interesting because there is no central state, and very often it is uh, uh, portions of the customary pastoral institutions that are brought into the forefront when it comes to political to political negotiations. So it's a kind of a rebuilding institutional structure, structures using to a large extent Somali uh, pastoral customary institutions. So it's a, it's a place that for economic as well as for political reasons is relevant and is a place that uh, is a kind of a good observatory of what happens in pastoral regions. And it's also relevant for the, the regional setup in the sense that it provides the exposure to the global markets to the Horn of Africa, as well as it provides a, a laboratory to, uh, how do you say, to reshape and to, to reconfigure the political economy of, uh, of pastoral areas. Uh, well, okay. this, is, this has been the long rush through the different regions. As, as I said, and I'll be brief here, we identified that despite this huge diversities and big differences that characterize the different regions, these, these various regions, we've understood, well, at least we looked through the, these, uh, these works and we identified the kind of some key principles that all over the globe, the pastoral populations, they seem to apply, they seem to apply when trying to uh, cope and adapt, to cope with and adapt to the different and the shifting degrees of uncertainties that affect them. Um, these are just very broad, uh, as you can imagine, very broad principles that sometimes they do not necessarily associate just to pastoral populations, can be, can be associated as well to other uh, rural or non-rural livelihoods, but basically they represent what are the, I would say, the pillars around which pastoral livelihoods adaptation capacities hinge on. The centrality of livestock that remains even when, as we've seen in MENA, people move out on one side and they are forced to hire somebody else to take care of the flock. Livestock remains central in the sense that people, that pastoral, lively, that pastoral households, they keep on investing into livestock production even though livestock is not giving the most part of the revenues of the family and sometimes when it is a, a costly endeavor, livestock remains central in the local, uh, in the household economy. Livelihoods, on the other side, have been reconfigured uh, through mosaics of uh, different livelihood strategies. Very often you would find uh, members of the same pastoral households in the urban setting, in uh, providing fam uh, farming labor, living abroad and sending remittance, uh, working as a trader or uh, working for the trader. So you very often find that uh, somehow the strategy applied to the livestock, diversifying the herd and uh, having di different functions within the herd, it can be replicated and can be found as well in the household. So people, different members, they tend to undertake different functions and different roles in the local household economy. And very often this, uh, this role and the different economies they link up with, are, uh, they tend to be complementary in time and space scale, so that there's always the capacity to fit the, the system from one way or another, or an area or a period to another. The issue of mobility remains quite central, and that has been uh, supported and helped in recent decades by technical and technological evolutions. We mentioned the issue of mechanized transport in MENA region, but we also saw how motorbikes are, are instrumental in, 
in, the, in developing the meat marketing in northern Kenya, not to mention mobile phones that uh, enable uh, connecting and reconnecting continuously and even uh, transacting money and uh, information at the, at the real time. So definitely mobility is not only present, it might be not the mobility we are we normally associate a pastoralist to, as we saw in the case for Maghreb and Mashek, but definitely mobility is one of the key words that is still within the system. What is interesting as well is that very often territories, the rangelands, are not only rangelands nowadays because we've seen that some members might be in the diaspora in, uh, in the US or might be living in southern Italy, and therefore those territories they have expanded, the pastoral territories they, they have expanded out of the rangelands themselves, and uh, the way these territories are conceived and very often operate, uh, people operate through are conceived as kind of reticular uh, territories, I mean, sources of, uh, of opportunities in a reticular way, meaning that there are hubs and lines that connect different, op different opportunities. And it's not just the case where the hub, well, the, the, the knot of the web is the greener part where the farming, or the, <coughs> the wetter areas is located, but uh, one, uh, the case of one important hub is the city of Tamanarset in the middle, basically, of the Sahara, that is a central hub for local trade and uh, traffics. So uh, the reconfiguration of uh, pastoral territories has gone through this uh, kind of reticular dynamics where new opportunities have been created and new, new resources have been generated. And as I said, the global exposure of most pastoral economies has also been quite critical in the reshaping of uh, uh, the uncertainties related to the marketing, creating opportunities. 80% of the Pecorino Romano cheese produced in Sardinia is exported to the US, just to give you a, an example. And the Somali, Somali coastline exported about 6 million animals uh, in 2017 to the Arab uh, the Arab region. So the global exposure in terms of market engagement, but as I said, as well as in terms of international migration and diaspora creation and uh, remittance uh, that is sent back into these territories. And the last point is that the sociopolitics as well have been uh, reconfigured to a large extent. Uh, pastoralists are well known for the networks and the, the, socio, the social the social assets, as they would call them, the social capital they have to play with in order to enforce their capacity to access farming land during the non-crop period or to access rangelands when other groups are also present. This social capital as well has, has scaled up to a large extent, becoming something that has to nowadays play with a much more, uh, I mean, to political economy degrees that are much higher than, than those that used to be 50 years ago. The case of the Movimento Pastori Sardi in Sardinia, they, have, they are nowadays discussing in, uh, with the government in, uh, in uh, Rome, but they will uh, sooner or later also face the uh, WTO agreement, trade agreements, because uh, milk product, I mean animal products, they have to enter to fit within certain uh, specific requirements. So the global exposure needs uh, a scaling up of uh, the socio and pol the social and political capitals of pastoralists and this goes together with an extension and a, 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 a development of uh, their networks. Uh, some areas have been more consistent with this such as the Sahelian case with a, there's a regional pastoral association is called Mil Bilital Marobe that since 20 years has been raising pastoral advocacy at the regional level and even international one. In the Horn of Africa that is much less the case in parts of Europe, that is the case. In uh, Central Asia, we've seen other uh, systems taking place. But anyhow, the fact is that pastoralists basically they have to play on a different playground nowadays. They have to face a, an international, a global agenda when it comes to the politics, when it comes to the economy, and therefore the socio-political capital has to upscale accordingly. <laughs>